Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome again to St. John's Riverside Hospital's webinar series. Today's topic is coping with grief, how to move forward. Um, my name is Denise Mananis. I'm the AVP of External Affairs for St. John's. And before we begin, I would like to just thank uh, my team, Jason Latore, media production manager and producer of our program, Nancy Anabi, our community liaison, and Candace Cousins Hopkins, Associate Director of External Affairs, for all the hard work that they do to make this series possible. Um, today, our presenter is Reverend Paul Bryan Smith, a director of spiritual care. Uh, but before we begin and before I introduce him formally, I'd like to thank our partners. Uh, Sally Pinto is from the Yonkers Neighborhood Naturally Occurring Retirement Community, which is under the umbrella of the Office for the Aging in Yonkers and Westchester Jewish Community Services. And Z Baird is from the Yonkers Public Library, and they have three wonderful locations, the Riverfront, Will, and Crestwood. So we wanna get right into this topic. This has been a topic that um, has been requested by our community, and I think it's very um, timely that we address it as the year is, is winding down and we're going into the holiday season. Uh, I think that it's, it's something that is on everyone's mind. So, let me tell you more about Reverend Paul. Reverend Paul Brian Smith holds a Bachelor of Arts degree, cum laude, from Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, Virginia, where he double majored in sociology and religious studies. He was awarded a Master of Divinity degree, cum laude, also from Midwestern Seminary in Kansas City, Missouri, and was a postgraduate research fellow at Yale Divinity School in New Haven, Connecticut. He completed his clinical pastoral education at Norwalk Hospital, where he worked with psychiatric inpatients, and at Westchester Medical Center, where he worked in the neonatal ICU, the pediatric ICU, and the pediatric oncology, um, and with pediatric oncology patients and their families. Tough stuff. In his 30 years of ministry, uh, Reverend Brian Smith has worked with congregations in Virginia, Missouri, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Connecticut. In addition to hospital chaplaincy, he has also served as chaplain to several police and fire departments. Reverend Brian Smith has been uh, the director of spiritual care for St. John's Riverside Hospital since 2013 and works as part of the hospital's palliative care team. He serves on the hospital's ethics committee as well as the cancer committee and the institutional review board. He supports St. John's Riverside Hospital's medical education program, working with resident physicians as they integrate their medical training with providing spirituality and emotionally sensitive patient care. In addition to his work at St. John's, Reverend Brian Smith serves as the pastor of King Street United Church of Christ in Danbury, Connecticut. He has served on numerous uh, denominational boards and is currently on the executive committee of the Fair uh, of the Fairfield East Association of the United Church of Christ. And uh, I just want to add my own little editorial to this lovely bio, which is to say that Reverend Paul is one of um, St. John's healthcare heroes. Um, during the COVID surge of 2020, uh, Reverend Paul donned his PPE and took care of not only our patients, uh, many of whom were alone in their struggle, but also our staff. And so he is um, he's our he's our hero that we we just love him and we thank him so much for being with us today. So welcome. Thank you, Denise. So we're going to jump right into this and um, let's get let's get started with um, grief. The word grief. What is grief? Grief is the response that people have to loss, and it can be any kind of loss. We usually think about it in terms of the loss of a loved one uh, around death, but it can be related to loss of a job. It can be loss of a friendship. It can be something uh, that we might even see as a positive, like retirement, but there's grief that can go along with that. Um, Right now, of course, as we're entering the holidays, we're thinking about you know the the sadness that comes when people are reflecting on usually the death of a loved one. Yes, and I think that right now, uh, the last two and a half years have been really traumatic for people, many of whom have lost loved ones, but also sort of a loss of the way they were living, the way they were celebrating. There's so many changes that have occurred. I think that we can all agree that that definitely behavior out there has changed. Um, and so we thought 
uh, and and are in total agreement with our community that this was a topic that we wanted to to talk about. So when you talk about grief and when you're dealing with your patients with grief, um, are there stages of grief that are recognizable? Tell me about tell me a little more about that. So classically, uh, there are five stages of grief, and that comes from the writing of Dr. Elizabeth Kubler Ross, who in the 1960s wrote the seminal text on death and dying. And that was a text that was actually looking at the stages of grief for people who were going through the dying process themselves. And the five stages that she enumerated were first off denial, then anger, bargaining, depression, and finally, acceptance. And as she laid this out, it was initially thought to be a linear process, that everyone would go through these five stages and they would arrive at this place of acceptance where everything was more or less fine. Um, since the 1960s, though, we have learned that those concepts of grief or those tasks of grief, most people go through most of them but not everybody goes through all of them. We don't necessarily go through them in a linear fashion, and we can bounce back and forth between them. So it's much more of a roller coaster ride than was initially suggested. That's very interesting. Um, so if the phases overlap, um, I mean, how how do you how do you see this in behavior? What are common attributes of each of those phases? Um, you know, denial, that's the one that we all find when when we get bad news. Oh, no, this can't be true. And that doesn't usually last that long when it's an external grief. But when it's an internal grief, if we get a bad medical diagnosis, that's when we kind of pull on to, no, may, maybe things are OK. Um, maybe I don't need to go and do something. May, maybe it'll all just work out. Um, anger, we see that all the time. Um, you know, patients who come in and you know, they pass away, and it's a natural response for their families to want to blame somebody. Um, and whether someone's done something wrong or not, um, people still, that's their go-to emotion. Uh, looking for something that somebody must have done wrong. That can be aimed at the at the person who's died. You know, I'm angry at, at my grandmother because she smoked. I'm angry at my brother because he didn't take good enough care of her. I'm angry at, at the doctor because she died even though we brought her to the hospital. I'm angry at myself because maybe I should have done something. So that anger can focus any number of places. Uh, you know, the third one is bargaining. And, you know, that's, oh God, I'll straighten out my life. I'll go to church every Sunday if only this this has a different resolution. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't tend to work. Uh, but but it is something that we normally go through. I know that's that, that old line about there are no atheists in foxholes. You know, when the chips are down, <laughs> you know, people often find, you know, that that very simplified faith um where we try and make a deal with god um depression is probably the hardest one of those five stages or five tasks of grief um that's the one where it finally hits us we're just stuck um you know we we find it hard getting out of bed in the morning we find it hard going to work and doing our job um when people are having conversations with us our minds are, are somewhere else uh, and that's the hardest one because it's it's self-reinforcing in a lot of ways. Um, and I know that we're going to talk in a few minutes about ways that we can deal with some of the challenges. But the depression is really where most people run into trouble with the grieving process. And I, I, I did want to ask before you get to acceptance, but the, the depression one um, is very interesting because I think that we're seeing it, but what most people might think of what depression looks like is maybe not what it really looks like. Can you speak to how someone could recognize if someone is depressed? You know, some of those signs of depression, um, they can be subtle. They're just a loss of interest in things that used to hold their attention. 
you know, someone who loved to paint and suddenly they look at their box of paints, and they go, not today. So I've, I've got other things in my heart. Uh, people who just though the world is suddenly in shades of gray instead of in vibrant color like it used to be. Everything just has a little film on it. Every time you look at something, it reminds you of the person you've lost. And so it no longer brings you joy. So that that's one of those things where that depression can be subtle sliding in. Uh, it can be major depression. It can become clinical depression uh, where, you know, seeing a psychologist, a psychiatrist, getting on some psychiatric meds can help. Um, but, you know, the inability to function. So, oh, so I guess what I want to, I mean, all of these things for for the community out there, for, for ourselves, for our staff. How do you recognize it in yourself? You know, everybody has responsibilities and everybody gets up and they have to do what they have to do. But how do you how do you know when something's I mean, it's one thing for me to look at a loved one and say, Mom, you know, maybe you want to go and do something today and get out of the house because I see there's a struggle. But how do we know it when it's in ourselves and how can we help ourselves? I mean, there's that recognition, I think, is is an issue. That recognition is hard and most people don't look inward that much. Um, very often our friends and our family are indeed our best mirror to what's going on inside ourselves. Um, so to, to trust the people around you who when they tell you that, you know, you just don't seem to have that spark. Um, but I think that for people who have a spiritual connection, uh, who have a meditative practice, uh, for people who who have prayer as part of their lifestyle. Um, you know, those quiet moments where we're just reflecting and being quiet within our spirits, um, we, get, we can get a good sense of what's going on, uh, a sense of unease. Uh, yeah. So you were finishing up that, that stage of grief and the acceptance. It is, it, that sounds so much like a relief to me. Is that what that stage is about? Uh, to an extent, and you know that this goes back to the conversation that you and I were having the other day about the title of this webinar, right? Um, that was originally put out as when to move forward, um, and acceptance isn't about you know moving forward at a given time. It's about incorporating the loss into your life as to who you are, um, because once you love someone and you lose them, you never say, oh well, that's fine. I'm just going to move on. Instead, it becomes a loss that lives with you and you find that you can remember the positives. Um, in my own life, I remember when my grandmother died many years ago, uh, she was a bird lover and one of her favorite birds was the Eastern Bluebird. And she had uh, bluebird houses in her backyard. She had little uh, bluebird figurines in the mantle. They, they were just a big part of who she was. And after she passed away, I remember the first time that I saw a bluebird fly by, my heart just kind of clenched up and it just took me to a place of grief and I found you no know, tears being shed. Over time though, I've gotten to the point where anytime I see a bluebird, it's like, ah, oh, that reminds me so much of my grandmother and all the other good memories. You know, the, the sorrow is still there, but it's, it's softened. It's just become a part of the overall experience of who she was and the rest of the love comes out too. So I guess then I want to talk about grieving rituals because I think the process of grieving might be helped. And even if it's not a loss of a loved one, but a loss of a way of life or a loss, as you said, of, of not having, you know, retiring uh, and going to a different phase of life and you're grieving the, the, the change. What are the rituals surrounding loss and gr and grief that we can that can help us well i think most cultures and most religions have some sort of built-in rituals uh, in the jewish community for example sitting shiva with the family um, is one of those rituals where you have a chance to after the funeral sit down relax connect grieve together tell stories 
um, and hopefully even find some laughter as you tell those stories. Um, you know, the the notion um, in, in Victorian England um, that there were rituals that you would observe so that everyone would know that you were grieving, that you would wear all black for a while, and everyone would know what that meant. Then after a while, you'd switch to gray, and they would know that, okay, they're, they're grieving, but it's a slightly less intense grief. And eventually, you'd move on, and you'd move on through all these visible markers. We don't have, in our culture, a whole lot of really obvious rituals. Um, a lot of people will visit cemeteries, um, you know, make sure that they go and spend time in the, the presence of their loved one, as it were. Uh, to have some conversations and just open themselves up to that full range of emotions. Um, other people, they'll put up a uh, a small, I, I don't want to call it a shrine, but a shrine, uh, you know, where they have a photo of somebody, where they have maybe some of their favorite objects that help them remember. And over time, those kind of move from reminders of loss to reminders of love. I think those are some of the ways that we handle that that ritualization. And it's important to put those markers in because if we don't, sometimes we just get stuck in a place. Right. So so if it's not the loss of a loved one, but the loss of a way of life, for example, mm -hmm. what would your what, I mean, what have you seen out there that could be ways that people could help themselves through those? Well, you know, we've all just come through these dark days of the pandemic where you know, we all lost our lifestyles. Uh, we lost the social connections, those gatherings that we had. Um, and we found other ways of connecting. You know, to, you know, I'm a musician. And so one of the things that I love to do is to make music with other people. Um, instead of getting together in the same room, we started meeting on Zoom which you know, we couldn't sing together because of the lag, but we found time to be together in community. Um, other things that people do is they make time for their creative selves uh, to look for ways that they can be more engaged with that creative spirit. Um, so, you know, I mentioned painting earlier. Um, you know, if you have any gifts that direction, you know, to make sure that you spend some time being creative, paint something, draw something make music, uh, find some way to you know, arrange some flowers, something that brightens the world, but most specifically, you're part of the world. Read a book, go see a movie, uh, you know, take in art as well as producing it. You know, this then, is, a, well, let me just ask you this. This sure. is a little bit of an extension of that, but you know, I think there's also something going on with the loss of identity. Mm -hmm. where people have left jobs, not just because of retirement, but because of the change in what's gone on during COVID. Um, and people really do identify, you know, who they are based on what they do. Absolutely. So when you find yourself separated from what you do and you no longer are the VP of this or the director of that, or the shop owner or what have you how how do you recommend that people solve that or is it in similar ways i think the the obvious recommendation is that we all base our identity on something and when we're no longer the thing that we once were we need to find the thing that we can be life is always a process of becoming the next thing um, you know, I remember when I had left my last church. You know, I was no longer the pastor of the first congregational church. Um, I was instead a chaplain, and and that took a, a shift not only in terms of what my workday looked like, but in how how I processed things. I wasn't working within a faith community. I was working in a much broader community, um, which, which by the way I love. Um, but but we, I think, we love that. Well, thank you. But whatever the thing is that we're doing at the moment, um, you know, we, we may go from being, um, you know, whatever we are professionally, we move into retirement and we suddenly become a woodworker or a knitter or a volunteer with an organization that means a lot to us. 
Uh, but to connect with that next phase of life and to realize that, yes, we will always be what we have been, but we always need to find that new thing that we're becoming. Very interesting. Um, this was a question that someone had talked about, um, and I wanted to make sure that we touched on it, but survivor guilt. Mm -hmm. um, what is that? Is it real? Is it not? It is very much real. Uh, survivor guilt is one of those things that, uh, you know, classically we see it when there has been a uh, a death that takes place in the company of others. You know, we see that with combat veterans whose, whose uh, buddies have been killed, but they have somehow made it through. Or we see it when there's been a car accident and the driver survives, but the passenger has been killed. Uh, and and people are are asking, you know, why is it that I'm still here? Um, and sometimes, you know, it's it's very literal guilt, like that driver who may have been at fault in the accident. Uh, so they're carrying the guilt of the other person's death. But it's something that even when we're not at fault, even when it's random chance, uh, what has happened, we often just feel at unease because we can't make sense of why the why the dice roll one particular way. Uh, it doesn't make sense. And that's one of those unknowable things. And we all think that we should be in control of our lives and have control of the world. And we don't. And that's where that guilt comes in. It, it's a projected guilt rather than an actual guilt 99% of the time. And I'll let uh, Jason fact check me on that actual number. <laughs> okay. Um, is there such a thing as inappropriate grieving? Oh, certainly there is. Um, I think all grief starts off appropriate. When we're first hit with something, our lives crumble. Uh, we, we fall apart, we can't function. And over time, on a good trajectory of grieving, you move, if not through all of those Kubler-Ross stages or processes of grief, you at least move in the general direction of acceptance. And so life becomes less hard. Uh, each day it's less difficult to get up. You're engaging better in your daily activities. You're finding more joy in the things going on around you. Some people that's not the case. Um, you know, I, I know one couple uh, years ago, they had lost their daughter. And it was a crippling loss for them. And I do not mean to minimize that in any way, shape or form. But this particular couple, as they were grieving, they were at a point where even a couple years later, it, it felt like every conversation that, that anybody had with them began with, you know, our daughter died. And so they, they were holding on to the death rather than holding on to the love of the daughter. Um, and again, it was a deep trauma for them, and I don't mean to minimize that, but they were stuck. And that kind of stuckness where you're not improving over time, um, that's harmful. Uh, that's when it's really helpful to reach out to other people, um, to reach out to your faith leaders, to have conversations about grief. Uh, you know, the, Pastors of any stripe, rabbis, imams, anybody that you have that is a, a trusted faith leader um, is a good person to talk to about that. Um, and they may say, you know, I love you. I'm here to support you. And from what you're telling me, it, it's even beyond the, the scope of what a spiritual leader can give. Uh, maybe you need to find some, some psychiatric or psychological help. And there are groups that do that very well. Uh, one group that I often refer people to is the Bereavement Center of Westchester. Uh, and you know, I hand out brochures for them fairly regularly. And for those of you who are with us, uh, you can find them at the bereavementcenter.org. A fantastic organization. I would recommend them highly. So that's actually leads into the next set of things I want to talk about because we've already talked touched on a little bit um, sort of unhealthy coping mm -hmm. versus healthy coping um, and and getting help exterior help and you've just gone through some of that. Are there um, so the bereavement center is one place. Are there 
ways to find more information in the community, uh, that there are other avenues. How how can we um, make resources available? What what are the resources other than that? Well, that that's the number one that I refer to, uh, and and that's because operating out of the hospital, I'm dealing with a particular population. Um, you can speak with the with funeral directors. They have a variety of resources. If you're mourning someone who was a family member that died while they were in hospice care, the hospice agency actually provides bereavement support for a full year after the person's death. So it would depend on which agency, but you can contact them for support as well. Uh, again, your own physician can help make some referrals if you need psychological or psychiatric help. So they're another good resource for you. And finally, if you just need to talk, you can call me here at St. John's. Uh, you know, just call the hospital and ask for the chaplain and they'll put you right through. Well, you definitely are our go to person. Um, I, but I have to ask this question because you referenced before that most people do not check in with themselves uh, and they they maybe don't recognize their own uh, aspects of grief or grieving that they're going through. Um, and, and this is, I'm going to use this phrase, it's, you know, self-help. Self-help is, is, is tossed around in lots and lots of ways, but what other than going out and getting help in with a psychiatrist or the bereavement center or going to your doctor, your spiritual leader, how can you begin that healing process and take that control? What are ways to do that? I think the first step is to be honest with yourself about what you're feeling, to be able to just stop and try and name some of those emotions. Um, you know, is it sadness that I'm feeling? Is it guilt? Is it anger? Is it fear about the unknown of what the future may hold? Once we can start labeling things within our own experience, we're able to start dealing with it a bit better. Um, to then realize that once we're labeling these emotions, that we can start addressing them individually. Um, as opposed to just saying, oh, I'm grieving in a broad way. What does that look like? What experiences am I personally having? Uh, how can I build some ways forward? You know, I know people who they try and set themselves a timeline and you know that's that notion of when to move forward the when being always um but to build a timeline and say look i'm i'm feeling this right now and that's okay but the next step that i need to achieve is to, to be able to you know, go back to work you know I, I i don't have you know six weeks that i can take off after the death of my spouse um so i need to be able to go back to work you know, a very simple step, but a big one um, to, to say, OK, you know, it's it's been a certain amount of time. Maybe I need to be able to go to a movie again. And realize that I'm not going to a movie without my partner. Uh, but to sort of normalize those processes. And everybody's timing is different. There is no right timing. And anyone who comes and says, oh no, it's it's been six months, you should be better by now. No, that's, that's well-meaning, but misguided. That's very interesting, because I think what you're talking about are expectations, whether mm -hmm. they're societal or for, from the family or even from yourself, I should be better. Maybe we should all just give ourselves mm -hmm. a break. Well, we certainly should give ourselves a break. Because again, grief is a normal response to loss. There's nothing abnormal about grieving. What becomes abnormal or problematic is when we remain stuck at a point in our grief. And so to give yourself permission to feel what you're feeling. Uh, you know, when I'm with a family who's just lost a loved one um, and you know they're they're going through a box of tissues and they're saying, oh no, I shouldn't be sad because they're with God now. Like, no, no, tears are holy. You know, you're doing what you need to be doing right now. And, you know, maybe later you'll move to a different, a different phase. And that later may be five minutes or it may be five weeks. And that's okay. And so 
just keep it moving. You know, when, when you when you get stuck, that's where the problem comes. So one of the things that I'm hearing in here is that we all just need to be paying better attention to our loved ones if we're going through any kind of change in life or any kind of uh, situation where loss has occurred, whatever kind that might be, and just watch uh, behavior and make sure that people check in. But that check in also comes back to ourselves, that so we have to check in with ourselves. Right. And so. So what I was just going to say, so what other things are do you have in your bag of tricks for, you know, self-help? What are good things for people to do for themselves to make themselves feel better? You know, let me uh, not answer that question, um, okay. but, but instead answer the other question I was getting ready to answer, which is when we're checking in on other people. Because a lot of the time we're looking for uh, out for other people, we're trying to help them along. And very often, uh, you know, I tell people who've lost a loved one that their their number one job when people come through at the funeral to speak with them is to not kill people who say stupid and insensitive things. <laughs> um, because people will will say anything that comes to mind trying to be helpful. And when we're looking out for loved ones uh, who are grieving, um, they're experiencing grief that we may also be experiencing, but from a different angle. And so when we're looking out for loved ones, to be honest and kind, you know, to have those conversations and say, I've noticed that you seem to be having difficulty. Would you like to come with me to dinner tonight? So to make an invitation as opposed to saying, you know, you really need to get out more, <laughs> uh, but, but to make it kind and, and inviting, um, to make sure that when we're caring for other people that we're not trying to put answers to their questions. You know, I think about the book of Job and the Hebrew scriptures, how uh, Job had experienced the loss of everything he owned, including his children. And his friends came and sat with him for three days and said nothing. They were just present. And it was good for Job. And then they opened their mouths and started trying to explain to him what was going on. And of course they were wrong and then they then became a torment. Uh, you know, when we're with someone who's grieving, our presence is what's important, not the wisdom that we think we have to offer. Uh, so just be present, be loving, uh, you know, cry with people. Don't tell them they should be over it. Uh, so so that's that's the rest of my answer about when we're with others. Uh, and to get back then to your question about for our own grief, what can we do? Um, is allow ourselves to be vulnerable. Because sometimes, and especially for men, it's very difficult to allow the grief to show. Uh, you know, we're taught from the time we're little that we're supposed to be, you know, tough macho guys like John Wayne and never shed a tear. Um, and that's destructive. We may not want to, you know, go to work, um, you know, with tear stains down our shirt, but to find time to grieve, to find time to be honest about what we're feeling, uh, to have a friend that we can talk to and say, look, I just really feel like crud today. I, you know, I can't even name it, but I, I just need to sit and feel bad. And, and to make that an okay thing, to normalize the process. It's, it's always fascinating to talk with you. Do you have any other um, hints, tips, wisdom that you'd like to share with our audience before we say goodbye? You know, I'm going to go back to those really basic things. Uh, because grief is a normal process, the process of getting through it is also normal. And so each step that we take of finding things that bring us joy, things that brought us joy in the past and engaging in them until they bring us joy again, finding new activities maybe, uh, things that we haven't tried before that pique our interest, um, getting out and walking, um, or, or anything that's physically active, because physical activity always helps the body, um, and the body helps the mind. You know, it, it's just a cycle. Um, all of those normal things help. Talk to people, pray, 
become more involved in your faith community if you have one. If you don't have one, become involved in whatever community you have, whether it's working with your union or joining a bowling league or anything that draws you into contact with other people. It's good. I want to thank you, uh, Reverend Paul, for joining us today. Um, as I said before, you know, you are our um, our hero and our go to guy in our building. Uh, I you you minister to all of us and we really, really are very thankful for your presence here. So with that, uh, I'm going to say um, thank you again for your time. Uh, I just would like to remind our audience that if they are home and they are experiencing issues and they still have some discomfort about coming in for care, we do offer virtual urgent care and that number is 914-964-4429. Please don't wait to get care. Um, we are seeing the, the, the results of people who did not during COVID and, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that everybody out there is, is doing the right things for themselves. Uh, also, if you have general questions, um, please reach us through info at riversidehealth.org or if you would like uh, a physician referral for any for any type of doctor on staff at St. John's, you can email find a doc at riversidehealth.org. Both of those emails come to me, so I will be happy to answer them and or find out the answers for you. If you have questions about today's webinar also, feel free to uh, send me an info at riversidehealth.org or call us at 914-964-4444 and ask for me or ask for Reverend Paul and we'll be happy to uh, answer your questions. And... Finally, I think I want to just remind everyone that uh, the recording of today's webinar um, will be posted on our St. John's YouTube channel. Uh, it will also be shared on our Facebook and Instagram pages. Uh, so if you'd like to rewatch it or share it with other members of your family, your friends, your neighbors, your communities, please do so. Um, we are always here for our community because St. John's is community strong. And uh, thank you all for your time.